Welcome to the second lecture on the kinetic theory of gases. Last time around we saw the limitations of a simple ideal gas model and this time around as announced we will be using Boltzmann statistics um, to look at the distribution of molecular energies and as a consequence a distribution of molecular speeds. So now on the last slide, yeah, comparing our simplified model uh, with a model uh, with a real heat capacities observed for gases, we sort of see the limitations of a simple model that we've chosen yeah, on slide three. So one of the most uh, serious simplifications in our gas model was to assume that all particles had the same velocity v. Yeah, so due to Boltzmann, uh, uh, Boltzmann's entropy formula here in 1.15, um, we find, however, that particles building up a system, yeah, they must obey an energy distribution that directly results in a distribution of velocities. Yeah, so on the following slides, we will use uh, Boltzmann statistics to calculate the energy distribution in an ideal gas and derive uh, the velocity distribution from this. Yeah? So um, if we ask for the velocity distribution for particles in a gas, uh, then we would like to know which fraction of particles has a velocity between v and v plus dv. Yeah? So we want to answer this question in two parts. Yeah. First, uh, we will determine the energy distribution. Yeah, and from this, uh, we can then easily convert uh, um, the result into a distribution of velocities. Yeah, and this will be essentially the distribution uh, of particles that have a velocity between V and DV, uh, and V and V plus DV. Yeah. So uh, this question is analogous to the question of the energy distribution of electrons, yeah, for example, in a hydrogen atom that you might have encountered in previous parts of the course. Yeah? Um, and uh, for, for this particular question here, uh, we need on the one hand the density of states, yeah? d epsilon, here depicted in uh, equation 1.14, um, and after multiplication of uh, uh, this equation by a d epsilon, yeah, by the difference in energies, this will give us a number of states. Yeah, um, d uh, this will give us a number of states uh, between uh, the energies epsilon and epsilon plus delta e. Yeah, and on the other hand. Uh, we need the probability that a certain state is occupied. Yeah, so that for this end, we will use the Boltzmann, Boltzmann's entropy formula. Yeah, so from 1.14, uh, we get uh, for the density of states. Yeah, the following expression: This is d epsilon equals four times square root two times pi times v over h cubed times m to the power of three halves times epsilon to the power of one half so this is all still from the density of states formula uh, equals uh, gamma times epsilon to, uh, to the power of one half yeah so we essentially simplify this equation uh, all of this is essentially a constant and variable is the energy epsilon yeah, and this uh, this uh, whole expression here has a dimension uh, has a dimension of energy to the power of minus one. Yeah, so let us uh, multiply uh, this with um, the dimensionless number n epsilon. Yeah, this is the number of particles that have the energy of uh, um, epsilon. Yeah, hence we get the occupation density here, um, uh, n epsilon, yeah, which is equals 
n epsilon times d epsilon and again with dimensions of energy to the power of minus one yeah finally if we are looking for the fraction of particles with an energy between epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon we have to multiply both sides of this equation here with d epsilon yeah and divide the total uh, by the total number of particles n and we get so here essentially we take an epsilon yeah multiply both sides with d epsilon and divide by the total number of particles yeah to get to one particle and uh, um, uh, we get equation 119 yeah so here again we've got gamma times alpha times epsilon to the power of one half times e to the power of minus epsilon divided by kt times d epsilon yeah so this is uh, still from our multiplication of both sides by d epsilon yeah um, divided by gamma times alpha times the integral from zero to infinity of epsilon to the power of one half times e to the power of minus epsilon divided by kt times de so and we can obtain now the total number of particles by integrating between these limits zero and infinity yeah which we have already used here on the right hand side of equation 119 yeah so this integral here uh, in the de denominator of the equation yeah this integral has a value of one half square root of pi kt to the power of three half yeah remember your trig functions so let me just draw it in maybe yeah so as i said this integral here yeah, if we do the integration from zero to infinity over de uh, over d epsilon we get one half times square root of pi times kt to the power of three halves yeah so then essentially we get this gives us the energy distribution in ideal gas here in form of equation 1 20 so n epsilon divided by n the total number of particles d epsilon gives us a function yeah of the energy uh, d epsilon equals 2 pi times 1 divided by pi kt to the power of 3 half times epsilon 1 half times e to the power of minus epsilon divided by kt d epsilon so this energy distribution function yeah 120 is plotted here in the figure on the right for nitrogen yeah the temperature is 100 k and 300 kelvin yeah so let's look at it in more detail yeah we've seen on the previous slide uh, that equation 120 and also equation 119 are normalized yeah because we divided by n yeah this means that the integration over all energies yeah integration between zero and infinity with respect to d epsilon must yield the value one yeah so because we've normalized independent of temperature yeah so now our figure here on the right hand side i've chosen the x and y uh, scale in such a way you yeah, have the y value yeah here um, uh, 10 to the power of uh, 2 times n uh, epsilon over n uh, 10 to the power of minus 21 joule indicates a percentile fraction of particles that have an energy between epsilon and epsilon plus delta epsilon yeah uh, which means uh, we, they are within an energy range of one tenth of the corresponding x value yeah again 
long explanation uh, short yeah here we essentially have a percentile value of how many particles of a given uh, um, how many perc percentile of a, a percentile fraction of particles have this right kind of energy of, of epsilon yeah so in the position of the maximum of the energy distribution yeah um, uh, this approaches epsilon equals zero yeah in Boltzmann statistics uh, uh, in when we approach uh, T equals zero Kelvin. Yeah, so you can sort of see it here. Below we go to in, in temperature from 300, 100 towards zero Kelvin. Yeah, the more does this maximum um, uh, of the energy distribution curve approach epsilon equals zero. Yeah. Um, so how do we actually find yeah, uh, the uh, maximum uh, of the energy distribution curve at finite temperatures. Well, we can do so by differentiation of this epsilon function here by epsilon. Yeah, so if we do that, we get epsilon max. Yeah, so the maximum of this curve equals one half times kT. Yeah, so here epsilon max is the energy at the maximum of a curve. Yeah, that means the most frequently occurring energy. Yeah, so here we see again yeah, the percentile uh, fraction of particles of this given energy yeah, and this maximum. Here we have also most of the particles of that given energy. E max equals one half kT. Yeah. So now uh, to arrive at the velocity distribution, yeah, we can now substitute velocity for energy yeah, and we get these two equations epsilon equals one half mv squared you remember our considerations for translational energy previously yeah, and also 123 d epsilon equals mv dv yeah, so essentially uh, derivatizing this yeah, and using uh, this relationship in equation 120 we get also the velocity distribution in ideal gas here, 124. Yeah, so this is essentially analogous in both instances, just with a substitution of velocity for energy. We get NV divided by N, the total number of particles, uh, times dV equals uh, our velocity function dV. Uh, and this is M divided by 2 pi kT to the power 3 half. Uh, times 4 pi v squared times e to the power of minus v squared divided by 2 kt times dv. So let's now compare the energy and velocity distribution functions at different temperatures. Yeah, so the left figure here um, shows us the uh, velocity distribution of nitrogen molecules at two different temperatures, again 100 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin, yeah, and in contrast to the energy distribution curve, yeah, our function epsilon, um, the velocity distribution curve uh, function of V has a parabolic curve, yeah, um, at low x values, yeah, because of this V square factor, yeah. So characteristic for this uh, velocity distribution of gases is the fact that with increasing temperatures, yeah, going from 100K to 300K, uh, with increasing temperature, the maximum of the curve decreases yeah, and at the same time shifts towards higher velocities. So here we have a plot of our, of our velocities. Yeah, and because of v, uh, this V square term, the curve is uh, not symmetrical with respect to the position of the maximum. Yeah, so the higher velocities are favored over the lower ones. Yeah, you can sort of see it here: steep, steep increase at lower velocities, and this tailing off yeah, at higher velocities. Um, as a result, yeah, this, this means that. Uh, uh, the mean velocity, yeah, V dash, is not identical 
to the most frequent velocity, yeah? uh, v max. Yeah, v max is here at this point, and uh, v mean will be slightly different because the higher velocities are preferred. Yeah, um, and uh, the mean velocity, yeah, v v dash, and the mean value of a velocity squared, yeah, v dash squared. Um, are of great importance yeah, for, for later calculations. Yeah? Hence, in the following, we want to determine these quantities, v dash, uh, uh, v squared dash, yeah, and v max, and compare them. So again, uh, analogous to the uh, energy distribution in ideal gas, yeah, here we can obtain v max, yeah, that means the speed at the maximum of a curve by differentiating this expression, uh, this function uh, of velocities, yeah, here from equation 1.24, by v. Yeah, so let's do that. So differentiation of v by v. So we get uh, dfv by dv equals 4 pi uh, times m divided by 2 pi kt to the power of 3 half. And here in brackets, v squared times e to the power of minus mv squared divided by 2kt times minus mv divided by kt plus 2v times e to the power of minus mv squared divided by 2kt. Yeah? And again, how to get to v max? Well, we have to uh, set the first derivative to zero. Yeah? So this is here in the equation 1.26. Yeah? And we now essentially... Uh, following from these two equations, we now solve for v max, yeah, and we essentially get as the most frequent velocity v max equals square root of 2kt divided by m, yeah, and uh, uh, we can also get this in molar quantities by substitute, substituting m as a molar mass, yeah. So let me just draw that in here. So here in this case. For molar quantities, m is our molar mass. Right, now to determine the mean velocity, v dash, we essentially have to divide yeah, the sum of all the velocities by the number of particles. Yeah, so if we get the sum of all the velocities, we essentially have yeah, the mean velocity for all particles, and we divide by the number of particles to get to one particle. Yeah, so then we get our v dash, and we can get the sum of all the velocities by the integral yeah, of a product nv times v. Yeah, so this is essentially this expression here, yeah, so the integral um, over the product nv, yeah, times v, yeah, which will give us, so nv times v will give us the sum of all the velocities, yeah, and then again division by n to get to one particle, yeah, which will give us our mean velocity, yeah. So uh, this, this entire integral now looks a little bit uh, difficult, yeah. So to solve the integral, we expand v by square root m over 2kt, yeah. And we can essentially take all of this term out, yeah. So if you play around with this a little bit, you can take out the entire term here, and we are left with the following integral, yeah. We essentially substituted v by square root of m divided by 2kt. Um, so now the question is, uh, what did we gain? Well, we're actually in luck because this entire integral has now the form of integral between 0 and infinity of x to the power of 3 e to the power of minus x squared dx. Yeah? So you can sort of see this here. Yeah? x is our v times square root um, m2 pi kt. Um, so we get this to the power of 3. Yeah? This is this term e to the power of minus v times square root 
of m divided by 2kt squared. Yeah, so this will be this term times dx, yeah, where x is again v times square root of m divided by 2kt. And this entire integral actually has a value of one half. Yeah, so that's great. So this is this is why we why we did this trick. Yeah. So this entire thing, if integrated between zero and infinity, will give us a half. Yeah. So this is a essentially a normalization. If we went from minus infinity to plus infinity, we would get our our one. Yeah. But we're interested in this thing, which is half. Yeah. So essentially, the the mean velocity, the mean velocity of uh, uh, our particles then is equal to square root of 8kt divided by pi m equals the square root of 8rt divided by pi m when we use molar quantities. So now remember from our expressions for the kinetic energy, yeah, there is a v squared term, yeah. So we need a way how to get the mean velocity squared, yeah, this this expression here somehow, yeah, because it is needed to calculate the mean kinetic energy, yeah. So we integrate uh, essentially the product um, of velocity squares squared and the normalized distribution function, yeah, to get uh, equation 1.33, yeah, so this is essentially again, as I said, uh, uh, product of a velocity squared and the normalized distribution function, which you saw previously. And again, we expand uh, v by uh, square root of m divided by 2kt, yeah, and we get the following equation again. You can play around with the integrals a little bit and you can pull out all of these constants here and you get an integral between zero and infinity of the following form. And again, we're in luck yeah, because this integral has a form integral from zero to infinity x to the power of four times e to the power of minus x squared. Yeah, And again, this is one of these uh, uh, famous integration tricks. Yeah, so this entire integral has a value of 3 eighths times square root of pi. Yeah, so uh, let me just write it down somewhere so that we don't forget. So this entire thing has value of 3 eighths square root of pi, yeah, and hence we get our equations for mean velocity squared equals 3 times kt over m, yeah, oh, now we can't really see that, let me just remove it again, but keep this in mind, yeah, and we get the square root of a mean velocity squared, yeah, so the square root of a mean velocity squared equals square root of 3kt over m equals square root of 3rt over big M for molar quantities. Yeah. Now let's finally compare yeah, v max and v dash and square root of uh, v squared dash. Yeah. So let's appreciate these ratios for a minute. Yeah, they will come in handy very soon. Yeah, so v max to v squared to the square root of mean velocity squared. Yeah, is uh, square root of two for v max, square root of eight over pi for v dash, and square root of three. Yeah, for square root of mean velocity squared. Yeah. More importantly, yeah, given equation 1.35, uh, the average kinetic energy of a molecule is given by this expression here. Yeah. So again, this is the equation we use. Yeah. So the uh, average or the mean kinetic energy of a molecule is, as we've written now, derived on, se uh, on several ways, is one half mv squared yeah, equals three halves kt.
Yeah, so this is in uh, now the, now this one uh, you can just essentially go back in your notes to equation 1.9. Yeah, so this is in perfect agreement with our uh, previous derivations. Right now there has uh, um, been no lack of attempts yeah, to experimentally verify Maxwell's velocity distribution as we derived it here, yeah, and to derive uh, to to verify it experimentally, yeah. And uh, one such setups is uh, for this purpose is uh, this velocity analyzer of a type used by Miller and Cush, as seen here. So in this setup, we have a furnace O that is heated to a certain temperature, yeah, and you have a substance, for example, an alkali metal that you vaporize in here. And then this vapor can essentially escape in all directions, but you have only one hole in the furnace, yeah, for which the vapor can actually escape. And then you sort of um, uh, pass this vapor cone, yeah, through... Um, uh, through a system of apparatus, yeah, here designated B, so that you essentially, by the end of uh, this stage, you get essentially a molecular or atomic beam, yeah, and this molecular, uh, this beam of atoms or molecules uh, of a certain speed um, can, uh, is then sent through a velocity analyzer, yeah, and finally they fall into uh, on a detector D. Yeah. Now the trick in this setup is in the velocity analyzer. Yeah, this, this velocity analyzer consists of a solid cylinder yeah, with closely spaced helical grooves on it. And um, at a certain frequency of rotation, yeah, you can imagine that only atoms or molecules of a certain speed can pass through the entire apparatus yeah, without collision. Yeah, these particles that then get through and hit the detector, yeah, they have a fairly narrow, a narrowly defined range of speeds yeah, when they hit, finally hit the detector. And by varying the rotation frequency of a cylinder, yeah, we can now measure the velocity distribution yeah, by essentially measuring the intensity of incoming particles. So the particles uh, uh, whose velocity distribution is described here in equation 1.24. Yeah, they have all essentially three degrees of freedom of translation. Yeah, and uh, this term here, this function v, gives us essentially a probability uh, uh, that uh, velocity has any direction in space. Yeah, so in any direction in space, and a magnitude between v and dv. Yeah, it does not account for a sing singular uh, molecular beam. Yeah, so for the special case yeah, of, uh, of a directional interval, yeah, described through these uh, velocity components Vx, Vy and Vz, yeah, we can imagine that the probability is decreased by a factor, yeah, we we'll call this factor Q, yeah, if we just go along one particular line. So let's have a look at this factor. Yeah. So uh, um, so this factor Q uh, is essentially the now the, uh, for the probability of a particle go lo uh, going along a certain directional vector. Yeah. So we can essentially say Q is the area element dA yeah, of a directional interval on a sphere with uh, constant velocity. Yeah. Divided by the surface of the sphere with constant velocity. So imagine this essentially uh, all particles emanate from one central point. They travel at a constant speed yeah, so that they, they essentially expand like a sphere. Yeah? And if we now consider only one fraction of the sphere, yeah, so this is this area element dA, yeah, then of course we only have a certain yeah, fraction of particles going through there. And now if we express this uh, factor non-narratively, we essentially get Q equals dA divided by 4 pi V squared, yeah, or equation 1.39. Yeah? So this is uh, essentially holding true because all spatial directions, yeah, Vx, Vy, Vz, are equivalent. Yeah? So now if we take into account that dV times dA, our uh, area element equals 
d cubed v then uh, um, yeah which is essentially now the volume element in velocity space corresponding to the now restricted possibility of uh, velocity variation then we, we can essentially express this in Cartesian coordinates yeah so we can express essentially this term v uh, sorry fv in terms of the Cartesian coordinates vx vy and vz yeah and equally we can express uh, um, v squared which would be part of this term in terms of v squared equals v squared x plus v squared y plus v squared z yeah shall i write this down yeah, probably a good idea so essentially here yeah we can we can now define uh, a volume element in velocity space yeah, so this is our volume element. In, well, we'll call it velocity space, yeah, V space. Yeah, and we can now ex essentially express our velocity distribution function yeah, not just in terms of general vector v, yeah, but in terms of the Cartesian coordinates vx, vy, vz. Yeah, this is clear. But equally well, we can also uh, express v squared yeah, as the sum of its uh, uh, Cartesian coordinate components. Yeah, vx squared plus vy squared plus v z squared yeah so essentially so this term here is equivalent to this and equally well we get the velocity distribution here yeah in the same way so now because of the isotropy yeah so traveling along the x-axis or one axis uh, and the multiplicative property of probability, yeah, uh, we get now the following for the velocity distribution in one dimension. Yeah, this is equation 1.42, where we essentially eliminated the vy and vz terms. Um, so we can derive uh, uh, corresponding terms if we considered uh, velocity distribution along the y or z axis, yeah, just by substituting in here vx, vy, and vz as we need it. So in equation 1.42, yeah, we can sort of see that uh, the term vx only occurs in the exponent of this e function, yeah, and it does so quadratically. Yeah? So we conclude from this yeah, that the velocity distribution in one dimension must be symmetrical. Yeah, to vx equals zero, yeah, so uh, and have its maximum also at this point. Yeah, so the figure below, essentially the figure here, shows uh, the one-dimensional velocity distribution. Yeah, plotted once for 100 k yeah, and 300 Kelvin for nitrogen. Yeah, and we we would essentially get directly yeah to this equation 1.42 if we had used the density of states for a one-dimensional gas and plugged it into 1.41 yeah, into this equation but uh, we arrived at there and there anyway so um, we note also yeah here we divide by n in both these equations 1.42 and 1.41 so both are normalized yeah so it means effectively uh, if we integrate over all v space yeah over all velocities between zero and infinity yeah um, or in this case all vx yeah between minus infinity and plus infinity then this should yield us a value of one yeah so now we can calculate here from equation 1.42 the mean velocity of the particles 
moving in one direction. Yeah, that means moving um, moving into the positive x direction. Yeah, so if we want to do that, we we must obtain the modulus. Yeah, of uh, v x. So this is the modulus. Yeah, or the, uh, the modulus of the mean velocity of particles traveling in the positive x, x direction is given uh, by um, square root of kt divided by 2 pi m, yeah, or kt divided by 2 pi m to the power of 1 half. Yeah, let's compare this now with equation 1.31. Yeah, so this was the mean velocity. Uh, expression um, and we see hence yeah that the modulus of vx is exactly a quarter of v dash so now we know how to relate the principal quantities v max uh, v dash and v root root mean squared yeah so uh, equipped with that we'll be looking at collisions and gas diffusion in the next lecture